a few moments on considering the next section in Bernal's treatise. Now, <clears throat> over the last number of weeks, we've seen he said within the section where he's dealing with the Christian's breastplate. So he's dealing with, with holiness and the need for holiness. And he's been dealing with Satan's attacks on holiness. We've seen that he says that holiness hinders pleasure. Secondly, that holiness hinders prosperity. And then last week, we saw that if these two tactics don't work, he tries a third one. He tightens the screws. And he threatens righteousness with heavy opposition. Uh, trouble of all manner kinds. Now that might make somebody uh, be afraid and turn back and so on or turn away. But Gurnall gave us three reminders um, in connection with that. First of all, he says, if you are in that situation, remember God controls all men. And he gave two examples, Jacob and Laban and Mordecai and Haman. <coughs> Secondly, God can bless that difficulty when it comes, whatever size or shape it might have, more than peace and easiness. And uh, it's safer, he says, in some ways, in the friendship of the world and peace within it. And then the third point he makes is remember that when you lose the world's blessing, you gain the Lord's. Well, he moves on now. And first of all, tonight, we're going to come to a little section which sits by itself, where he makes two points about holy living and the holy life, two particulars about the holy life. And we'll deal with them, first of all, they're very short. And then he begins a slightly longer section, and I shall take the first and maybe the second point that he makes there as well. <clears throat> first of all, then, <clears throat> two particulars on living a holy life. The first one is this, and they're, they're both straightforward. And I was actually tempted to, to skip over this bit, but he has some nice thoughts in it, and I, I, it's worth pausing at. First of all, he says, sin and holiness do exist and do oppose each other. Now, I don't think I'm going to have to convince anybody here tonight that that's the case, but let's hear what he's got to say. We live in a generation, now remember he's writing a long time ago, which treats sin and holiness as the melancholy imaginings of timid men and women. And if he did, so do we. Some even brag about being free from the tyranny of holiness that they can live as they like without being accountable to an unbending conscience. And if that was the case then, how many fold now? They rationalize that sin does not exist except in the mind. How often we hear this sort of thing as well. Thus, these are even worse fools than the one that David described in Psalm 14. These people go further because Psalm 14 says there is no God. Um, these people go further and shamelessly announce to the whole world that they are fools. Because the psalm, in Psalm 14, he's saying in his heart, I think that's the point Gurnall's making there, the fool says in his heart there is no God. But he said these people, they, they're, even, they're even worse than that. They, they say to the whole wide world and they demonstrate their folly in so doing. Now he then makes this comment, I am not mentioning these ungodly people merely to dis, disprove them. That would be as senseless as proving there's a sun on a clear day because somebody chooses to deny it. He says, I'm raising this point to impress upon you the abominable times we live in. What a deep sleep we have slept that the enemy could have come in to sow those tears among us. Maybe we took it for granted that such poison seed would not grow in our soil where Christ's servants have worked so hard to clear it. He's thinking again of his own day and of the advances that have been made in the gospel and so on. Yet experience has proved 
that when disease invades a city, it rages more freely in pure air than in polluted climes. And when a spirit of delusion falls on a people who have enjoyed the gospel most, it quickly grows to epidemic proportions. And I, I think he's right there. Um, an area that has known gospel blessing that turns its back on it, it becomes more barren um, than almost anywhere else. I mean, there are parts of Scotland that are like that, you know, and even parts of our islands that are like that. It makes me tremble, he adds, to see the weeds and the nettles springing up in England when for so long she was one of Christ's most fruitful garden plots. When men fall so far from the profession of the gospel and become so blind that they can't tell light from darkness, are they not sliding backwards into atheism? This is not natural blindness, says Colonel. Even the heathen can tell the difference between good and evil. And he's right there as well. They can see holiness and sin. They do it without scripture light to show them that. Their conscience showing them, either uh, accusing or, or, or excusing them. As, as the apostle says in Romans, they can see right and wrong. But we've reached a stage, and if, we, if it had been reached in Gurnall's day, dear me, it certainly reached in ours, where they can't tell light from darkness and where there's such a blurring of it that they would deny there is such a thing as light and darkness, right and wrong, absolute values are gone. And Gurnall is saying that's worse than the heathen who are in absolute heathen darkness. And he adds, this blindness is a plague of God, which has fallen on them for rebelling against the light that they did have. And again, we believe he's right. So that's the first general point he makes. Holiness and sin do exist and do oppose each other. Secondly, it is possible to live in the power of holiness. Now, I think he's already touched on this, but I'll just mention a few things he says. It is possible to live in the power of holiness. God wouldn't commend you to do something if it was impossible. He wouldn't encourage you to do something if he didn't supply you with the power to perform it. But he adds a warning. He says, remember there's a difference between legal righteousness and evangelical righteousness. Now, I'll just hit the pause button there. Legal righteousness is what the Pharisees had. A keeping of the law uh, in the hope that that itself would um, give them a right standing before God. Evangelical righteousness is a holiness that springs from God's work and God's grace and is a desire after following God. And we'll, we'll say more about that tomorrow evening, actually. Of course, not all God's children have the same stature and strength. Some walk in holiness more easily than others. But there's never been a saint endued with new life from Christ who hasn't had a true desire and some success in the matter of evangelical righteousness and who does not desire to do more than he is able. Well, there's a mark of grace for you. In fact, there's a handful of them. Isn't it? A seed is tiny, but contains, contains the bigness and the height of a mature tree inside it. And it continually puts forth more and more strength as it goes to maturity. Thus, in the very first principle of grace that's planted at conversion, there's contained the perfect and complete grace in a sense. That's an interesting thought there. That is, the desire is in him to grow up into that perfection which God has appointed for him in Christ Jesus. In a word, Christian, when thoughts of the impossibility of having this holiness here on earth are suggested to you, Reject them and send them straight back to Satan. He knows your efforts for holiness will prove him a liar. Help us continually to be holy and keep your eye on God's promise to help. And don't be afraid, for God the Lord's a sun and shield. He'll grace and glory give. Grace to glory. God will keep adding more grace what you have here on earth until your grace on earth merges with glory in heaven. And he quotes James 4 there, and that's why I read James 4 
um, James 4 and verse 6. <clears throat> and um, forgive me because, yes, he giveth more grace. He giveth more grace. Well, that's the two points he's making. Sin and holiness do exist and do oppose each other, and it is possible to live in the power of holiness. He then moves on to a, a longer section where he's making three points. Let's change my time. And this section is headed reproof or um, rebuke of unholy people. And he, he identifies three types of unrighteousness which flourish around us. First of all, there's the person who's quite happy in their unholiness. They make, as we say, no bones about it and no pretense of it. Now, in a very real sense, Gurnall points out that this is the natural state of every person on earth. Our sins dictate and cut out our work for us. And it's a sad and wasted life <clears throat> which is spent on such a beastly work as sin. The Apostle Paul linked the bond of iniquity and the gall of bitterness in Acts 2. And anyone who plants sin and unholiness and tries to harvest anything except bitter fruit claims knowledge beyond God himself. Again, that's a very interesting little, little point there. You know, if people say, well, I can live as I want and um, yet a, a, a good's going to come of it and happiness is going to come of it. Well, they're claiming to know more than God. They're, they're claiming to be wiser than God because God has said that won't happen. And you see people sometimes and they do, they do things, they do appalling things, and they say, well, it's for happiness. It's in the pursuit of happiness. And God says, oh, no, 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 <laughs> that's not going to work. And uh, time comes and, and it demonstrates that God is right. He guarantees that the natural fruit which grows from this root of sin is gall and worm. Now, of course, the devil, through centuries of artistic cookery, and here's one of Gurnall's typical illustrations coming up. The, the, the devil, through centuries of artistic cooking, might cover up the bitter morsel of unholiness <clears throat> with such clever ingredients that you can't taste the real flavor of it. But as Abner asked Joah, knowest thou not that it will be bitterness in the latter end, 2 Samuel 2. Hell will melt all the sugar, the pill was quoted with. And then, if not before, you will taste the true bitterness of what went down so easily. How many in hell today must be cursing their feasts and their feast maker too? While the false economy of Satan's deception is not hard for Christians to see, very few people ever consider what's happening in eternity. They see sinners die every day in the middle of sin, but they don't think any more about them than fish in the river wonder what happens to their fellows who are snatched by the bait. And that's true, isn't it? They think no more of it than the fish in the river thinks about their mates that they've seen caught by the angler. Even though these fish who are snatched uh, are cast alive into the boiling pot or into the frying pan, their silly companions are ready to nibble at the very same hook. In the same way, careless men and women eagerly pursue sinful pleasures and the wages of unrighteousness, which have taken millions of souls before them into damnation. There are some people, and they're satisfied in their unholiness. But there's another type of unrighteousness that Gurnall identifies, and it's the people who hide behind a counterfeit holiness. <coughs> now, these people are just as unholy as the ones in group one who are content in sin. But they wear something that looks like the Christian breastplate. And it saves their reputation in this world. Verily I say unto you, they have the reward, Matthew 6. And what a measly reward. And then he goes on to point out 
that actually they're doing the devil a double service. And God a double disservice. How? Well, if you march into battle armed with hypocrisy, first you draw the prince's expectations towards you as a soldier who will be faithful to him. But then when you do nothing, he sees only a traitor taking up the place of the faithful armed for victory. You actually do your prince more harm than the coward who stays at home or the rebel who runs over to the enemy's camp and at least makes it obvious what he's going to do. And you, know, you can think of Judas here. He's, he's the obvious, if extreme, example of this. Be serious, friends, says Gardner. If you're after holiness, make sure it's through holiness. Put on the new man, Ephesians 4. Observe two phrases in that verse. Put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and through holiness. Holiness is called the new man after God. That is according to the likeness of God. And here's an illustration. Such a sculpture is drawn from God's being as an artist copies the face of a man. So it's after God, after God's likeness. Also, true holiness means a holiness of scripture truth. Not Pharisee, not Pharisaicalism or traditional doctrine, which has as its point of reference the heart but a holiness which has as its reference, a point of reference, a heart, which is a seat of truth or falsehood. I'm going to read just one more paragraph. I'm going to leave it. My time is running and my voice is also running. In order to have true holiness, then, the Christian must have righteousness and holiness in his heart. Many people, and here's another kernel illustration. Many people have beauty of holiness, which is like the attractiveness of the body, skin deep. If you tear away the most beautiful body on earth, you'll not find much except blood and stench, says Garner. And it's the same way when counterfeit holiness is exposed. It will only be left with an abundance of impurity. Paul assured the high priest, God shall smite thee, thou whited wall. And if you're a hypocrite, that's the apostle's word. God will strike you as a painted tomb. Because the whitewash of religion that you've applied to the profession of your faith doesn't dazzle others into admit admiration of your sanctity as much as your rottenness will make you abhorred by everyone that sees it. He then goes on to make a third and longer point, and uh, I'll spend a little time on that next week, if we're spared. Um, uh, and then um, we're actually coming close to the section at the end of the, of the breastplate. There's only maybe another two, two, maybe three weeks of it. And we come to the, the shoe and be shod with the preparation of the gospel. Peace. Well, may the Lord bless our consideration of these things tonight. I'm going to